Welcome to Doctors on Call, COVID-19. This is Calming Fear with Facts. We've got with us today a distinguished panel of experts who have talked about health disparities for a number of years and have some information today that we believe in the course of this 60 minutes could save your life. And so you wanna pay close attention. Let me quickly introduce you to the panel who will be speaking with us today. We have with us Dr. Georges Benjamin. He is the executive director of the American Public Health Association. Also joining us is Dr. Donna Christensen. She is a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives coming to us this morning from the Virgin Islands. We thank you for being with us as well. Dr. Reed Tuxen, who is a managing director at Tuxen Health Connections, also a member of the advisory board for the National Conference on Health Disparities, has long been an advocate for ending health disparities and eliminating them. And we welcome you to this discussion, Dr. Tuxen, as well. And then last but certainly not least, a new friend for us, but we're excited to have you on board. And that is Dr. James Heldreth, who is the president of Meharry Medical College out of Nashville, Tennessee. We welcome you to this dialogue and discussion today as well. Thank, Thank you, everybody. So you. the question that's on my mind is, all these years we've been talking about health disparities. In fact, Dr. Benjamin, about a month ago, I saw the article you were quoted in where you sounded the alarm that African-Americans were gonna be dying, uh, that this virus hits, we're gonna get hit hard. And we're seeing that real time. Is this what you all thought it would look like, this pandemic would look like once it hit because we knew the health disparities were already there? You know, I absolutely um, was concerned about it, which is why I raised the red flag quite a while ago. and I. I got to tell you, we, we saw um, this early on with H1N1, although we had a vaccine, so it didn't get to this point. Um, but I'm absolutely, based on my clinical experience, and I'm sure the others um, knew this was going to be like it is. You know, we knew that uh, for many, all of the reasons that we'll talk about that the African-American community was going to be hit hard, but we, didn't ex we expected our country to be better prepared. The fact that only now data is coming out, um, supplies are still, you know, not where they need to be. Um, so we expected that our communities would be hard hit, but we thought we'd have the resources to deal better, do better with them. I guess from my perspective, if you look at the data that came out of China early on, it was very clear that individuals with hypertension, diabetes, or some other more comorbid condition were getting sicker and dying. So we could have predicted this way back in early January, December, if we had had a national strategy that was paying attention to what was going on. So it's disappointing, but not surprising that we find ourselves having this conversation. If we'd had a strategy, I'm still feeling like there's no strategy, but are you feeling that perhaps we might have something or what is it that you all believe we should be doing? From my perspective, uh, given that people who have underlying conditions are vulnerable, that includes people in nursing homes, for example, or assisted living facilities. The only way to protect them is to keep the virus out of those communities. And the only way to do that is to have a strategy that involves testing, 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 contact tracing, all those things you do to keep the virus out because we don't have a vaccine, we don't have a drug. So the only thing we, need, we, we can do is keep the virus out. And that requires a small army of public health workers, uh, planning, testing, testing, testing. So, and that's where we need a, a coordinated national strategy because a pandemic is a collection of epidemics that are breaking out in various places. And that's been my biggest disappointment that there is no coordinated national strategy. And on top of that, viruses do not respect borders. So unless we're all on the same page in this, Tennessee might do a great job of controlling the virus, but if the neighboring states don't do that, as soon as we go back to normal, we'll be, we'll be back in the same place we started. That's what I mean by a national coordinated strategy. I think that uh, that's an extremely important point. And so the point that I was trying to emphasize is that uh, if you, we, are, we are experiencing a perfect storm of yes. a bunch of variables all coming together at the same time, and it's completely predictable. The yeah. fact that we live in such concentrated environments where we're such densely connected together in terms of our population in the urban cities is a, a significant issue. The sense that we have the pre-existing conditions and health conditions that we know so well, 
but also the prevalence of tobacco smoking and also inhaled substances that puts our lungs at risk. The real concern around not having, um, in terms of the access to uh, quality of health care and availability of health care is a significant issue. But above all of them, as Dr. Hildreth just sort of mentions, I'm particularly concerned about the issue of trust. If we realize that we are not listening to the messages that we are being given, and in fact, in too many cases, we're acting in ways that is inconsistent with best guidance for very uh, understandable, perhaps, uh, historical reasons. But as he mentions, the next big fight here is going to be how do we identify people who are positive going forward and then do the contact tracing and the social isolation. Can you imagine the kind of problems our community is getting ready to face in implementing that? And the fact that we do not have a national strategy, nor do we have spokespeople from the African American community who are prepared to seed the ground with appropriate information, appropriate preparation to allow this to occur, uh, occur. I think we're really getting ready to face another whammy on top of the one we've already had. Amen. And, <laughs> and, and, and the fact is that, that, that Dr. Tuxton is absolutely right. Um, now, and you understand the, the, the history he brings to this argument that he's making is what we saw in the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, and um, I know Dr. Hildreth absolutely was involved in this fight. And Dr. Christensen, of course, was in Congress. So we've all had to deal with this. We know that we have to get to barbers and beauticians and people of faith. We've got to speak to people in culturally competent ways. Uh, we've got to deal with all of our public facing members of our community who are, who are at enormous risk. We've got to make sure we demand that employers do some things to put them, uh, make them safer. And we need to give them the skills of what they're going to do when they get on that bus. Right now, there's not a lot of people on that bus. They can physically distance. But what do they get on when they get on that bus and that train and it's packed? How do they protect themselves then? So we got to give them the skills and knowledge to, to, to actually do this. Uh, I know we're going to talk about returning a little later. But right now is the time to put that information in play. You know, and I just wanted to go back a bit to say, you know, we really didn't shouldn't be here. We've been meeting for what, 13 years, Carolyn? Yeah, 13. And, and trying, you know, beating the drum about health disparities and um, calling our country to action. And I mean, our 13 years, it goes back. We've been hearing about these disparities for centuries. And I don't know, I, I'm hoping but I'm really doubtful that our country is even going to listen after this. So we really need a lot of activism. We need everybody to be very vocal wherever we need to be to, to make people listen because this is, you know, this, we've been saying this for years. You know, one thing else I, I think in addition to that extremely important point, and, and, and I note that, that again, as we focus this segment of the conversation on what we're going to do right now, uh, the notion of testing uh, is extremely important. Dr. Hildreth, had, I think, did some very important work and made some very important comments that were distributed nationally about the, the variability of testing in our community. The point being that one of the things that, that Dr. Christensen is talking about is that we have been aware for so long of the disparities in the quality of care that we receive, the way in which the health system interacts with us. I am very disturbed to be seeing reports of thousands of African Americans who demonstrated symptoms, but were not referred for, tra for, for, uh, for, for testing. So this is another element that I think we're going to have to deal with, and that is to hold, and I think, by the way, let us be extremely complimentary of the health workforce that has put Absolutely. itself on the line saving people's lives. So I want to be careful about beating up uh, the delivery system at a time where they are really li literally, uh, you know, risking their lives. That being said, I think we as African-American physicians are going to have to be working in compassionate ways with our colleagues, working with them in responsible ways with our colleagues to help them to understand that they may be, even with their good intentions and their wonderful heroic efforts, they may need to also be thinking about the biases they bring to the situation so that we can be sure that our people are being referred for testing appropriately based on scientific evidence. Well, testing, because Dr. Hildred, you said that word probably about five, maybe 10 times. Testing, we need testing. 
I'm hearing people can't get a test, okay? Or either there's disparity there. There's the friend that's in Washington whose doctor refers her to Bethesda and she gets a test in Bethesda, but the friend right. in Maryland, they're not doing any tests. Right. So if that's the solution, how do we get there faster? Unless you know where the virus is. Some people have referred to this as the invisible enemy. How do you make the invisible enemy visible? You test, you have to know where the virus is. And especially in vulnerable communities, you then do the things you need to do to keep the virus out of those communities. But the fact that we spend three and a half trillion dollars on healthcare every year, and we're scrambling to find squad, swabs and face masks, it's just incomprehensible to me. I, I mean, there's no way that this should have been the case, but it is the case. So what, I, what I'm trying to do at Meharry Medical College, and I'm sure others are doing, is to have a focused effort in my own community here in Nashville to make sure that the people that we care about can be tested, will be tested. And that is why we set up our own assessment center because we didn't want to wait for the city or the state to do it. We just decided to do it ourselves. But we were we had it ready to go for over two weeks, but we couldn't launch it because we couldn't get supplies. That should not be the case in this country that we live in, but it is the case. I, I, what can I say? Same here. We, you know, we should be testing all of the people who work with our seniors in, our, in okay. places where the senior housing or in our prison. We, and we don't have enough test material to do the kind of testing that we need to protect our community. Um, we do testing, but um, supplies and PPEs are really hard to come by. So it, it really limits, it limits us here as well. This is an important point. And let me just quickly insert here. While we certainly have reasons to be celebratory and concerned about the workforce having protective equipment and, and so forth to do their jobs, the way in which many of those people or patients get to the hospital is on public transportation, it is on other kinds of, of elements that, that, that have us providing service uh, to get that. We are, are appropriately applauding at seven o'clock at night, all the health workers, and, and you have all kinds of people blowing horns and so forth, and that's terrific. But we're not blowing horns for the poor folk, the lower class folks who are having to do the service work to make all of that happen. And I think we've got to really, really decide in our outrage, in our advocacy, is to say, you have to give the people that are on the front lines that are so-called essential which does not mean and should not mean throw away people. That's right. But they are essential people. If they are essential, they should essentially have what they need. Let me, let me just say, turns out this week is National Public Health Week. Yes, it is. And we have been not just celebrating those people that are paid to do public health, but we've also been celebrating those people who all of a sudden realize that their second job in life is public health. Mm -hmm. So we welcome those sanitation workers, those grocery clerks, um, those people that are cleaning those rooms. We mm -hmm. want to welcome you to our family of public health. And I just want to publicly thank you on behalf of the American Public Health Association. That's right. For protecting the American people and Good being for out you. there for us each and every day. So I'm still hearing a couple of challenges for us. And, and, and I shared with you that where I was going in this second phase of questioning was we're sitting in the here and now. I'm, I'm, I'm quarantined in the house with my 80 year old plus parents. What can we do to stay safe? Is it just be an advocate to keep get the messaging out and make sure other people are doing it? But what can what can families do with this time that they have that we're now quarantined? Can I just say that in a case like you described, where there's an 80 year old in the house and that person is living with younger individuals, some of whom think that they're impervious to the virus, they're not gonna get infected and they might not get sick but they can be a vector for the virus and bring it home to that 80 year old person who's living with them who might not fare so well. So from my perspective, the first thing we gotta do is deliver that message that while the virus may not be a threat to your life and health, it will be to somebody you love. So we really need to adhere to all these things that are being described. But I'm acknowledging that in some households where you have five or six people living in close quarters, we might not be able to do that. So. We need to take some actions to protect the people who are living in those environments. And that requires resources, PPE, and some other things. So we got to get people to understand this is serious. And even though only a minority of folks get really sick and die, those happen to be lots of who we love and who we care about. And let's do things to protect them. 
And that's what I'm really worried about in those households where people are living in crowded conditions and can't social distance. If the virus breaks, if the virus infects one of them, it's probably going to infect all of them. So we got to we got to know where the virus is and try to keep it out. And also, I think, you know, we, we've got to do the basic things. Number one is let's make sure in our houses that we continue to do hand washing. Let's make sure that we are sanitizing uh, our, our surfaces and things. And by the way, when you use those, 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 those bacterial wipes, don't wipe it off as soon as you put it on with another paper towel or something. <laughs> Let those things stay on there. I think a lot of people forget that it, it takes some time for those things to do their work. One of the challenges, and I know that I'm going to raise a challenge by giving you an answer to a question, and that is, let's take good use of, 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 of our smartphones and, and our internet connections. Again, recognizing that in some of our communities, we don't have adequate broadband, but we do have a lot. And Black folks do spend a lot of time online. So I know with my, uh, my 95-year-old mother, uh, who's in an assisted living facility in a different city, I made sure that I got to her a device where I can see her and she can see me and we can have conversations. And we're having a lot of family gatherings by Zoom and mm -hmm. FaceTime. All of those things help. Also, I would suggest that if there is a grocery run that has to be made, and we do have to go and make grocery runs, you put on the mask, whatever you do when you go out, you put on your gloves, but then if you know that there is a family next door or around the corner or in your apartment complex, go shop for them. Combine it so that only one person has to go out, do all of it, bring it back for everybody so that everybody doesn't have to go out and risk their lives. Do it in sequence. Come together as an extended African-American family. This is our tradition. We've been doing this since slavery. So we ought to be able to have that part down. Uh, and then finally, I think we need to be really careful about church. And we know how important faith is, but we should not be the ones going out as we are continuing to see uh, to, to church environments and then coming back and infecting grandma. So right. let's do church online as well. And maybe we can have prayer in our home and, and make that a big part of it. Those are some of the things we should be doing. And Reed, I think you probably would echo the same with funerals. I know there are limitations in some places where only 10 people can attend the funeral. And I, I think it was Chicago that I read, they actually have done the research to determine that it was a funeral and a party that created a, a, a much, the vector piece. And I'm gonna come back to you, Dr. Hildreth, get ready, I want you to walk us through the vector. But okay. but do you wanna yeah, add no, to I that? I think you're funeral? absolutely right. And, and I think one of the, one of the, the most horrible aspects of this pandemic is that people are dying alone yes. and as a oh, result not only are they dying alone but they're having to be buried alone oh. and so i think this starts to really be a, a, a horrible a, a reality but having yeah. said that it comes back to i mean i get a gazillion uh, pieces of things to my cell phone with people from all kind of black social networks we have every kind of joke and every kind of crazy little <laughs> thing and it lightens the mood. We've got to translate that because we do have access to social media. And let's remember we do. Let's translate that into creative ways. My, 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 my wife had a birthday the other day. We had a national family birthday party on Zoom. You can do these things and we're going to have to learn to adapt. Uh, uh, talk about this vector because I yeah, I have to first of all tell you the public service announcements have been huge the response has been amazing people talking about the simplicity of the explanation helps them understand why I'm sitting up here with a mask on why I'm sitting the distance that I'm sitting talk about the vector piece so I I, I talked about the vector in the context of there have been three pandemics since 20 since 2000 2002 of SARS 2012, it was MERS, and these are all coronaviruses. Now, the difference between this pandemic and those pandemics is, in the case of SARS, you only got it by having contact with these cats and some other small animals. With MERS, it was camels. Unless you had contact, direct contact with these animals, you did not get infected. And that's because viruses need vectors to be transmitted from one host to another. And in the case of zoonotic infections, zoonotic infections, the virus is going from an animal to humans. The difference this time is we are the vector for the virus. And that's why it's so easily transmitted in the human population because we're spreading it to each other. In other words, in the Middle Eastern, Mediterranean uh, SARS outbreak, 
you had to be in close contact with a camel to get infected. And the mortality rate is much higher, but fewer people interact with camels, so the death rate was very low. This is very different because we ourselves are giving the virus to each other. We are the vector for the virus. And that is why we, the social distancing works. That's why the masks are necessary. That's what makes this pandemic different from the other two. Not to mention the fact that the basic reproductive number for this virus is four, which means that on average, we infect four other people if we have the virus. And if you do the math, that means that one person can infect a million people in 60 days. Think about that. One of the, the best advice I've heard is everyone should act as though we and everybody else has the virus. We protect ourselves and we protect everybody else. Um, exactly. That And I, I keep giving that message here, here at home. Everyone should act as though they and everybody else has the virus because we don't know. We really have three epidemics. We have this infectious disease epidemic. We have what we call an infodemic which is an <laughs> epidemic of misinformation. Lots yes. of crazy stuff going on the internet and people sharing with one another. That just doesn't make any sense. The problem is some of people believe that stuff mm -hmm. and, and act accordingly, which puts us all at risk. And of course, the third one is an uh, 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 epidemic of fear, right? Um, we're, not, we're, not, we're afraid of who's walking next to us, who's talking to us. Um, we're afraid to go to work. Um, and so we, and a lot of that's because of misinformation and misunderstandings. Um, we've got to understand that we've got to address this from a science basis. You know, yeah. so this is not mysticism. This is not secret stuff. We don't know a lot about the virus, which we're learning, mm -hmm. but we're learning through science. And so all of those folks that, that are ignoring science, um, I think are doing so um, um, against our best, our best um, um, uh, needs. Uh, you know, George, is, there's a, there's a, let's put, there's one big issue related to that that we have to really put on the table. And, and I, I think you, you really open up an important door. We in the black community have reason to be fearful of the way in which our society treats us. And as we've seen now, there are a number of African-American men in particular who are afraid to put on masks and or bandanas because of racial profiling and the sense that something bad will happen. And in fact, we have seen a few anecdotal cases where um, security guards, you know, knucklehead, stupid security guards in stores have followed black folk who have on their masks or their bandanas um, and, and, and single them out for heightened sensitivity. Having said that, the one thing we all learned, and everyone on this panel learned during the HIV epidemic, you know, is that every time we would try to get folk to be responsible about wearing a condom, you get somebody bringing up Tuskegee. And, yeah. and, you, and, and I used to always on these, tele, on these uh, whenever I would reach and talk to the community about these issues, I would ask them, what does wearing, that have to do with wearing a condom tonight with your lady? <laughs> so, you know, we have to be able to separate these things out. So right. for, we have a tendency to want to take our, our sometimes legitimate, but conspiratorial theories and then use it in ways that harm it so that you get hit twice. The racism bug hits you on the first end with racial profile and then you get hit on the second end by the way we react to it. Yeah, so I just hope that we have to say something to ourselves and we can't, and white people can't say this to us, only we as black people can say it to each other. And that is, there is something called personal accountability. There is something called being responsible to protecting the health of your brothers and your sisters and your mothers and your fathers and your children. And so please, let's don't fall prey. And by the way, the other thing, George, is that you open up, which is fundamental. In this world of, of, of messaging coming from the Russians, coming from the Chinese, coming from others who want to sow discord and confusion in our community, we're getting a lot of crazy things that are being deliberately planted to make us run into our own walls. So let's just decide now. We have to stop this foolishness, hold ourselves accountable for our behavior, and stop letting old excuses cause us to die in new ways. Your comment speaks right to one of those questions I've seen out there from people who are suggesting, why would I go into a place and let them test me? Y'all remember Tuskegee, right? Why would I do that? So you're right, we've got to get rid of that history. We've got to get past that history. I mean, this, this death and dying out here in these streets is real. It is real. And you know where it's going to come up even worse? This is where it's going to come up. 
we're going to hopefully have a chance for a vaccine. And the vaccine testing will have to go on. Now, at one level, we will complain, perhaps, there'll be people in our community who will complain that African Americans were not evaluated in the clinical trials to determine whether the vaccine was successful for us. Then we'll have another bunch of people who are going to say, I'm not going to let them test me. I don't trust them. Don't you remember Henrietta Lacks? Don't you remember Tuskegee? So we're going to have this whole spectrum of, of, of stuff. At the end of the day, the only result of those kinds of paranoias are going to be we will die quicker. We won't have the vaccine. And the same will happen with the medications with, as we come forward. We need to decide that we're going to be able to participate in clinical trials for vaccine development and for drugs. But having said that, we as black physicians and black political leaders are going to have to redouble our efforts to give our community a sense of confidence that they can trust that these studies are going to be done fairly and that this is, and that the scientific principles are going to be well held. One way is that you make sure that um, at our historical black medical schools and research institutions that they're that they are uh, allowed um, and that we insist that they are part of those research endeavors absolutely that they're adequately funded to do so to that point we've been in discussions with the leaders of the congressional black caucus to make sure that next 2.2 trillion dollars includes money for the four black medical schools to do research on drugs and vaccines because we believe we can get our people involved in the trials and vaccines much more successfully than a white institution. So we totally agree. And we're trying to make sure that our medical schools are right there at the front lines in developing vaccines and drugs for all the reasons that you said. But Dr. Hills, also, if we could find a way to get some money, and I, we've got to start thinking outside the box. We need our hip hop and rap community to help <laughs> yes. us to get ready for this. Because the people yes. that we really need to reach are the people listening to our, 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 our media stars. And yeah. so they, there should be, right, like starting Monday morning, which is already too late. Monday <laughs> morning, we should be having the ability to convene the Kanye's and the, and, and the Drake's and so forth and so on, and have them be able to start pumping this message out. There is an online relationship that I know of between these people, but, mm -hmm. there's, but, but they're not concluded in any grant. So with your uh, influencer, Perhaps we can uh, do that, and if maybe you and I can talk offline at some point. That'd be great. Yeah. It was a really good um, town hall, sort of, with uh, Diddy, P. Diddy last night, and um, uh, Van Jones Mike, and, and, and uh, Al Sharpton. And they were, they were uh, uh, the hip hop people were really good. They, their message was really um, very powerful, and I agree with you. We we need to use them more. Absolutely. So let's talk timing, because somewhere I heard something about coming out at Easter, and I don't, I don't know about y'all, I'm not coming out. But, but let's talk about timing. Well, the biggest well, challenge, if I could, I, unfortunately, I'm going to have to go step away. So let me just uh, make one comment here. Um, we have, again, the double-edged sword. This is kind of like when, 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 when America gets a cold, we get pneumonia. Um, the timing is important because if we, we all want to be conservative on the timing, yet we are on the sharp edge of the stick in terms of economic vulnerability. And so th that we do have that, that double-edged sword. Uh, I think, though, that, and I would hope that this is what you would also be saying, uh, Dr. Hildreth, is that at the end of the day, if you come out too soon and this crisis continues to worsen or rebounds, then the economic consequences will be double. So That's I think that we, with, the, with, you, with our relationship with the Congressional Black Caucus and other well-meaning uh, political leaders, we're going to need to, in this fourth round of the stimulus package, really need to push a lot more money into the hands of the vulnerable, most vulnerable of our community. But, but because if we go back too soon and we get hit again, it's going to be doubly worse. A lot of... Um... References have been made to the AIDS um, epidemic, and I, I think we need a state of emergency. The numbers are, are crazy. So I know there's a state of emergency, but in our community, there needs to be a call for a state of emergency to make sure that the resources get to the, our communities. And, and let me remind folks, the most vulnerable in our community 
are already back at work. Mm -hmm. All right. So <laughs> what we need to be doing is making sure we protect them right now. And then we need to figure out how folks like me that can sit at home can get back to work um, and then and protect them um, and protect us. I think, think that's important. Reed is right. We don't need to go back too fast. Um, we need to follow national statistics. You know, my guidelines have always been arguing that we need to be following the death rates and the hospitalization rates. But let me go back to Dr. Hilder's initial point. That has to be, that information, which is clinical information, has to be coupled with information from testing, 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 and then utilized through old fashioned shoe leather epidemiologists. Exactly. Now That's you right. can do some of that online with, with, with social tools, right. um, through a whole range of, of new things that are coming out right now. But the bottom line is contact tracing, follow up, knowing who's been infected, making informed decisions about staying away from one another until in effect we burn this thing. And also one of the great things is going to be the, uh, the, 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 the impact of innovation. And so what you're seeing now coming out of Silicon Valley are extraordinary new tools for doing this kind of contact tracing using our cell phones and, uh, and using GPS data and so forth and so on. My point being that the modern world of innovation and technology, um, well, on one hand, may be threatening to people of color who are, again, concerned about trust. On the other hand, if we are not able to have access to the same new innovations, we will yes. see the disparities gap continue to widen by those who have and those that don't. And so one of the things, George, is I know that people like you are in a position to do is that we need to be sure that we are talking to the young innovators in Silicon Valley who have not had a lesson in history, who don't think about the issues that we think about, who are well-meaning, but perhaps naive about uh, their technology and how it works in the context of real life. We're gonna have to sensitize them uh, to, 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 uh, to what our struggles are and make sure that these new innovations don't worsen and exacerbate and already wide disparities. So I, I, I'm sure that you and all of us can get some of that done. Personal responsibility. When we hear about health disparities, there are things that we can personally do to make sure that we're not on that vulnerable list. Can you speak to that? I think that, and again, it comes back to always being respectful of the conditions under which we live and our history. But having said that, I for one, you know, am sick and tired of excuses. We make too many excuses about our health behavior. We control our own lives, as George said. No people but a people can save a people. We have got to stop waiting for the white man to come riding in on a white horse and save us. We knew, know how we're supposed to eat. We know we're supposed to exercise. We know we're not supposed to smoke tobacco. We know we're not supposed to be abusing drugs. We know all of those things. And what we've got to decide to do now is now that we see that because we have not because we have the health statistics and sta uh, uh, things that we have, so much of related to behavioral issues that we can control ourselves. Now we see the consequences when a virus comes and we now get it worse. So let this be a wake up call to us that says, you know what, today's the day I'm gonna take control over what I can control. Meanwhile, people like those of us on this call can continue to fight for the macro system to make it easier for them to make it better. But at the end of the day, if each individual does not decide to take charge of their own health, all the stuff that we're talking about will be to no avail. So Dr. Hildreth, you want to add to that personal responsibility? You, you, you certainly gave them some good guidance in some of the public service announcements, but what would you add to that point? Well, I would just say, I totally agree. And, uh, a lot of people point to the disparities in access to healthcare as one of our challenges. I'm always quick to point out that healthcare only accounts for 10 to 15% of our overall health. The rest of it's mostly linked to our behaviors and where we live. And so I think that I totally agree that this should be a wake up call to the nation to address the structural challenges that causes health inequities. But there's also a challenge to us ourselves to do better. And I hope that we will. Um, so I totally agree that this should be a wake-up call on many levels. And one of those is that we as individuals control much of our health by what we do every day and the choices we make. There's no disputing that. 
definitely agree. And um, on the other hand, it's personal responsibility and it has been said, it's also those of us who can have a voice to work on the macro areas so that even when people take personal responsibility, that the system is there to support them and make sure that they have the access to the care that they need. Um, and that, you know, we've been really relatively quiet as a, as a community and we really need to ha be more vocal and more active in ensuring that people start to listen because as I said earlier, the message has been going out and not much has changed in terms of the social, uh, economic, um, environmental determinants of our health. And if that does not change, Yes, David, I said it. If that doesn't change, um, nothing's going to change. Thank you. Dave. You're referencing Dr. David Rivers, who is with the Medical University of South Carolina and has been spearheading the annual gathering of the National Conference to eliminate health disparities. And again, as Donna said earlier, it's been 13 years that we've been having this conversation. You've been in the conversation too, Dr. Benjamin. What would you add to the personal responsibility piece? Yeah, let me focus on, on a couple things that, that Dr. Tuxin mentioned. Um, tobacco remains the leading preventable cause of death in the world. And so for all populations, we want the people to, to, to get help with their smoking. And by the way, you can still do so virtually. Um, secondly, we know that both tobacco use as well as vaping, particularly for young folks, it does for all populations, all ages, but particularly for young folks, um, puts them at risk. There's a, a fair amount of studies now coming out, um, both with China in particular, and some of the other nations of where people who smoke or vape are much more likely to get, if they get coronavirus, much more likely to get real sick and die. Yes. So we know that that's important. Second thing is, yes, we're all physically distancing, staying away from one another. Um, we talked a great deal about social cohesion as part of that. Dr. Tuxin was quite eloquent about that. But, you know, we got to figure out being about couch potatoes. And we need, we need to be active at home. Don't just sit at home if you're at home. Be, you know, become active. Eat, eat right, get up and, and do more. Um, that, that's gonna be very important. I mean, I'm one of these guys that struggled with my weight my whole adult life. And I can tell you that I'm getting up more and, and walking around because I'm doing a lot of these things on, on you know, on, the, on Zoom and other, other um, video type of conferencing. But you gotta get up and you gotta do some other stuff. Otherwise, you're not gonna be healthy. Um, and, then, and then finally, um, you know, find somebody, call your best friend, call your family, talk to your neighbor, stay engaged because this whole issue of loneliness and depression is a big issue. And this is not the time to know that, you know, your cousin or your uncle that you know is, gets a little blue um, around holidays and things like that. Now's the time to pick up the phone and engage them. Um, so that so that we can deal with issues of behavioral health, depression, domestic violence, child abuse, all those problems go up when we when we were forced to get together uh, under the same roof in close quarters. And we need to just cool out, take a deep breath and, and try to help one another. Dr. Hildreth, you would add anything to the thought of particularly on the mental health picture? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a stressful time. This is a stressful time to be quarantined for weeks. Yeah, I, I think it's really important and what we've done at Meharry is to try to make our members of our behavioral sciences department available to those in the community who need counseling or to tap into those services. It's really important, especially when people are living alone. And that's what we've tried to focus on is to make sure they feel connected. Uh, in any way we can, because it is a serious problem. You know, and we, we talk about social distancing, and um, I've started to talk more about physical distancing because so we still need to be socially connected. Um, here in the Virgin Islands, also our um, behavioral health uh, division of our Department of Health, plus a lot of the community um, behavioral health professionals are really doing a lot to reach out to the community on radio and, and through ads and different kinds of messaging. But we also are, have to pay attention to our staff at the Department of Health, which is also under a lot of stress um, dealing with those who have to work and those who are at home. 
we are indeed seeing an increase, I think, in domestic violence. So we're particularly, we met with um, a number of the organizations here at home that focus on domestic violence to develop some uh, ways of reaching out to our community to try to um, address that as well. When the pandemic first broke out, a lot of people said this would be the great equalizer. It has not. It has not been. But as we sit here today, and so many of you all have been, I almost call you futurist in the sense that, you know, you would come to these conferences each year and talk about what was happening in the community. What do you see ahead? What's your best prediction based on what we're seeing right now at this moment? Well, I sit with a, a group that's led by E.T. Windsor of uh, the Department of Education and Dr. Golda Downer at Howard that's a uh, uh, HBCU Emergency Management Workforce uh, Consortium. And we need to get more involved in emergency management as a community. Uh, I also sit with the um, Alliance, uh, the Mental Health Alliance, All Healers Mental Health Alliance, that talk, works with communities around the country who've had to deal with disasters. And the long time it takes for any kind of recovery to take place, not to mention the, dif the differences in responses in our community. Um, so we really need to um, get more involved in emergency management. We need to use our HBCUs. We've started to, a low pilot project on that to um, get our students more engaged in that so that we can have our communities better prepared for whatever is gonna come because this is one pandemic, but There'll be another, and there'll be another, and we need to be better prepared than we are. We don't know, you know, we don't know for sure timing, you know, over the, next, over the next couple of months, we know that we'll be getting more data around, um, we'll get better testing, we'll get more data around what's happening literally real, real time in the community. We'll have um, many of our urban centers that were first to get this significant um, uh, outbreak We'll begin to see, we'll peak and we'll be on the downside of that, we hope. Um, the challenge is, is that as we begin to reintegrate and go back out in our communities, we do have that risk of, of this returning. So it, it does have to be a measured return. Um, and um, I think we're going to have to insist on that. And then we hope, let, let's say we're all open and back and doing what we do um, sometime in the fall, hopefully early early fall, um, we have to hope that we understand by watching what's happening in other nations about the return of this virus and what their experience is. So integrating the experience of other nations into our policy and decision making, um, coupled with the real time experience that we're having each and every day in this community is going to be very important. And then I think we need to then step back and say, okay, how does that impact various populations? Vulnerable communities of color, communities that people that are in various sectors of jobs. We have to think very clearly about each of those and recognize we can't deal them with, with um, all the same way um, because each of them has different vulnerabilities, not just how they get exposed to the virus in their daily lives, but it changes when we start re re returning the community back to work. And we're gonna have to have this, it's gonna have to be a national engagement. Um, okay. We've already learned that good decisions can be made at the local level. People trust their local people much more, but it has to be guided on the national, the national scale. I agree with the last point that, um, you know, we have 50 states, each of those states is dealing with this in a slightly different way, in a slightly different timing. And I remind people that when the economy was at its fullest strength, there were like 44,000 flights a day and almost 3 million people moving back and forth all over the United States. And all it would take is one person who's not known to be infected to put us back in a position where we're having a, an outbreak, a major outbreak for that matter. So my concern is the, the, the lack of consistency and coordination in our country and part of this is what I call American exceptionalism. We had a leader or leadership who believed that somehow we're better, I don't know, stronger, healthier, that the virus will infect a few people, then go away. 
And that, that, that was a real problem, right? I mean, uh, and so we, we're kind of behind as a nation anyway. And now there's this lack of coordination and the virus doesn't care about that, right? So all it would take is a few people who slipped through the radar to put us back where we were. So I honestly think there's gonna be a series of outbreaks. Maybe each one of them is smaller than the last, but we're gonna be dealing with this, I think until the fall, maybe into early next year. That's my prediction. So you bring up an interesting point though, and, and, and we saw this certainly in China and we're seeing it here. We're getting pictures from the West Coast about our environment. And I'm sure you all have taken note. It, it, it feels like the Mother Earth is getting a rest, quite frankly. Lack of fog, flaw, uh, uh, smog and pollution. Um, are you all noticing any other environmental effects as we, we go through this process? Sounds like the planet's taking itself back from us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we've, had, we've had some um, improvements um, in the environment. Um, I just remind everyone that Prior to this, when we were before we started all going into our homes, the the most important global public health threat we had was climate change. Yes, it hasn't gone away. You know they're already predicting a bad hurricane season. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're already seeing severe storms because it's severe storm time, but it gets magnified under climate change. So the the Earth is already warm. We're already suffering the impacts of that. We're already suffering the health impacts of that. We also, for example, know that pollution also puts your lungs at more risk if you get the coronavirus, that you get sicker and die sooner. So right. we have to be comfortable with the fact that there is a little bit of a improvement in our environment, but not comfortable enough that we shouldn't still begin to implement and move forward on climate change as in particular. Um, yeah, we may have had, we may not have as much violence um, from gun violence because folks aren't out in the street right now, but we know it's going to come back in the summer. It always does. Right. Uh, we know that all those chronic diseases that people have, their heart disease, their lung disease, their kidney disease, it did not go on pause because of coronavirus. And so those folks that are not seeing their doctors right now, um, we're going to have another wave of bad chronic disease outbreaks as you know a few months from now as we continue to delay folks receiving the care that they need to get right now so we've got the roll up our sleeves and we got a lot of work to do and again disproportionately in our communities folks are going to get worse so we need to deal with that right now as well well i just want to point out that there are two other th threats that we need to be aware of that make me very nervous uh, one of them is that as human beings grow in numbers and we encroach in new habitats that we've not been a part of before, we're going to get exposed to microorganisms that we've never been exposed to before. And there won't be any herd immunity to those things. And those kinds of infections will race through the population because we've never seen them before. In fact, many people believe that some of the pandemics we've had have been because of habitat encroachment. We're moving into places that we've never been in before. And so we're going to experience new challenges that we never had before. The other one that I want to remind people, we're just a couple of mutations away from having a bacteria for which we have no uh, antibiotics to treat. Mm -hmm. And if that happened, I can tell you, tens of millions of people are going to die, right? And this is a real threat that we are responsible for because of the overuse of antibiotics in medicine, agriculture, and beyond. This is a real problem. It doesn't get talked about. And I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying that to me is as big a concern as viruses might be because we've overused antibiotics to the point we're selecting for organisms that are resistant to these things. And we're really close to, to being in a, a situation where there's going to be a bacteria, there's no antibiotic to treat it, and millions and millions of people are going to die. We need to change our, our behavior, not only yeah. as individuals, but as a, as a country, as a community. Exactly. exactly. You know, after 9-11, tragically, um, our nation changed a lot. Going through the airport changed. How we engage um, um, in a variety of ways in our society changed. We're going to have to recognize that this, we're not going to go back to the status quo. Oh, yes. um, I, went into, I went into the pharmacy, and they now got these little plastic things up 
go in the grocery store, you got these little plastic things up between us and the customer. Those may not ever go away. We've got to think about how we, you know, continue to move forward in a society. And yes, we should leave here um, well-informed, well-concerned, a belief in science, but we understand that we've got to change a lot of things. There are lots of threats out there. Mm -hmm. And right now we got hit with one that was so small we couldn't see, that passed from person to person. Mm -hmm. And But it's not the only one. We got to deal with this with some diligence and some intention. And if we're going to solve this problem, then we need to recognize that communities of color need to be part of that solution and that our future is absolutely in our own hands. We don't come out of this experience with the lessons that we've learned from all of the mistake, missteps and mistakes, um, then, you know, shame on us. We, we, we need to come out of this stronger and better than we are today. I'm going to pause it right there as we conclude this discussion, but we certainly have raised enough material and enough of my interest to know that this conversation has to continue and the advocacy that we need to do in our community must continue. It is not optional. Uh, I think yeah, you said okay. it, it, this is a new normal. We, we have to deal with that voting issue. And it, it's a problem. It's got, I mean, that's a real um, change that's got to take place in how we get people to vote. Yes. But voting are in our interest is critical if we're gonna move forward from where we are today. We saw this past week, the long lines in Wisconsin where people went out to vote. Uh, the hope is, I don't know, hearing you guys, we might still be in lines with our face mask on by November, <laughs> part of the new normal. But I think what I hear you saying do loud and clear, Dr. Christensen, is we gotta get out. Yes. Any other closing thoughts before we sign off here today? Yeah, not voting is voting way to make it easy for people to vote. There are many, many ways, whether it's vote by mail absentee or vote by phone, vote by internet. There are ways to do it. And we need to, sp us, we need to spend some time as a country figuring out how, we're gonna, how we will do it. Yes. I was pointing out the other day, if you can do the taxes online, you could probably cast that vote <laughs> online as well. That's right. Well, I can't thank you all enough for what you have done for us today. And that is to spend your time and to give us uh, some sound information that we believe can calm some of the fears simply by having some facts. And for that, we are thankful and we are grateful. We would be remiss if we close today without pausing and at least turning in reflection and remembering with fond hearts those that we've lost. I don't know about you personally, but in the last 14 days, I've lost three friends and a classmate. Oh, so yes. it has been a time of pain and a time of time of loss, but we ask that as we close, we, we bow our heads and thank those for the time that we had with them. And we yeah. only hope that we don't have more of these pictures of families in pain. Yes. 